All right. Um, my name is Michael Crump, and the title of the session today is Bring Your Existing Code to the Universal Windows Platform on Windows 10. I am absolutely thrilled that you were able to make the long haul and uh, come to the session at this time at uh, 9 a.m. Always makes me very happy. Uh, anyway, I'm a senior product manager um, at Microsoft, and I work on pretty much all things with Windows and specifically around, right around the Universal Windows platform. So thinking about this talk and thinking about what would be most beneficial to you as you start you know, thinking about the existing code that you currently already have and bringing it over to the platform, it's kind of divided into three main sections. Uh, the first one is obviously all about the middleware partnerships that you already have. So we have all, you know, probably worked with different types of middleware, and we're kind of wondering, you know, how does that play in a part with the UWP story? The next thing is what about the other investments that you've currently made with existing web? Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have been very, you know, been working with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. They're wondering, you know, hey, you know, can I do anything? Can I leverage any of the util utilities there or bridges or anything that you've made to kind of help bring that over in a language that I'm the most comfortable with? And then finally, there's other bridges that we've created that I believe needs a little bit of time to, for me to describe some of those to you. Uh, one of those would be the desktop app converter. And we've also made other investments in other mobile platforms. So if you've been writing for iOS, Obviously, we have something there for you. And I'm also going to talk about some of the porting guidance that we have for people that may have some code with Android. So the journey to Windows 10, um, it, it has taken some time, but we have now finally come to the point to where we have one core operating system and one app platform, again, with one store to de deliver your a package that will run on all of these six devices located here. So obviously the Windows desktop, our phone, the Xbox, IoT, HoloLens, and the Surface Hub. It's taken us some time to get it there, but now you're starting to be able to write this one application that runs on all of these different platforms. So again, we recognize that you've built and you've already created code that works on many different platforms. And you're probably thinking, you know, how can I start you know, migrating that code over to the universal Windows platform? So with Windows Phone, uh, we've had a partner that's worked with us that's mobilize.net that will help you take your existing uh, Windows Phone 7 and 8.x applications over to the universal Windows platform. We have the desktop app converter um, for any Win32 or uh, WPF WinForms applications. Then the iOS bridge allows you to pull over your Xcode project and it runs natively um, and so, uh, it converts and then it spits out a UWP package. And then we have hosted web apps. With hosted web apps, here you can take a website URL and you could package it up into one nice little container. And then again, porting guidance for a variety of other platforms. So if we break this down, we just quickly went over the Windows platforms, some of the uh, other platforms and web, and we're going to go into some of the middleware. But what does this do for you? So we have, you know, as was noted in the keynote, 400 million Windows 10 devices. And with this, now you're able to start, obviously, writing applications that will expand to reach all of these devices that people are currently using right now. Um, obviously, PC and uh, Xbox One. We just did a series on Xbox One, a, a video series on people showing them that. And then also mobile. And then other, as we have, plenty of emergent form factors with IoT and the holographic. This is also going to accelerate your time as you're building your application. You're going to be able to, again, stay in one code base, and you're going to be able to write an application that will adjust to these different form factors. 
built-in support for middleware and game engines. And again, it's completely at your pace. If you have an application, you may want to add one or two features to UWP at the beginning. You may want to ch change, maybe add some more code later on, and then finally just keep lighting up new features, such as Cortana and Live Tiles. Let's talk just a moment about middleware platforms. Um, middleware platforms is, is something that uh, you know you probably are already building apps you know across these different platforms. So if we take a look at some of the middleware platforms, you'll see that we've already uh, have quite a bit of different partners that we've worked with. Um, everything from development with uh, Unity and Hockey App and uh, Criterism and analysis with Visual Studio, and we had a big announcement with Adobe and Azure, and then uh, user acquisition, uh, Facebook, and as well as monetization, where you're able to start making more money out of the applications that you've built, either through for sale or through in-out purchasing. Next up is the Windows platform. So plenty of you have probably seen or worked with some of the existing uh, Windows A.X app, and you may even have uh, Windows Phone Silverlight applications out there. I know that I still do. As well as you have existing, app de existing desktop applications. When we partnered with Mobilize.net, they created a Silverlight bridge. And the Silverlight bridge, as you see from the diagram, from Visual Studio, you can load a project, you can convert it, it creates a UWP, and from there you can turn it into the store. Uh, one of the things to note about the Mobilize.net Silverlight Bridge is that, is that it's completely free, uh, it converts uh, your c -sharp code and your XAML, as well as the package manifest, and there's currently right around 2300 mappings for the top APIs. So I know a lot of people, you're thinking, you know, how does this, you know, how are sometimes mapping, what about third party, you know, libraries? Um, one great example of that is uh, Coding for Fun. That was one uh, library that was very popular during that time. And what people did uh, with that was they went ahead and they created mappings. And since, you know, this project is it's open sourced, at least the mapping part of it is, is that developers were able to go ahead and create those mappings, and again, you can you know, share those with others, but it was a mapping for the Coding for Fun toolkit. So I think that's where I'd like to start with today, is showing you exactly how I would take an existing Windows Phone application and convert that over to UWP. So let me switch over. Okay, I have a application that actually I went and I just downloaded it. So for example, this was called the weather forecast sample. Again, this, this one hasn't been updated you know, since 2013. And in this application, and then I went ahead and I downloaded mobilize.net. And you can just simply you know, get this free uh, utility from mobilize.net. I've loaded the project inside of Visual Studio already, and I went ahead and started this inside of my emulator. So I'm going to go ahead and run this application. So if I run this application, thankfully I've got a nice hardwired connection in here, um, you can see that this was the sample. This was how things were working. So you had you know, a couple of uh, cities and states here. And so if I drill into one of these, uh, it provided you know, some more information. Uh, one of the things about this application is if I go back, you'll notice that it had an about, uh, of an about button that you could click on and it would bring up this dialogue here. And this dialogue here actually comes from the Coding for Fun toolkit, if you ever used that before. So we have the application. The application is running just like we would normally you know, expect it to run. And again, I'm going to go into references here. And I'm just going to just call out, you know, here's the coding for fun toolkit dot controls. That's the only reference that's being used that's in this project. And again, this is a Windows Phone 8 application. 
So if I begin, it's as really as simple as this, at least to start with. You're going to find there may be a few things you need to adjust as you get into your, uh, get into your code. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to select convert to UWP. So the main screen that you see is, okay, let's select a project and where are we going to save it? So it just goes ahead and saves it in this directory and I'm just going to select the defaults and then I'm just going to press start. And so at this point, it's going through the existing solution file uh, in Visual Studio and it's trying to see, okay, you know, what is, what am I going to be able to convert? Where am I going to have problems? Because it's going to be prepared to show you a report at the end of this. Uh, this application has a couple of screens, so it doesn't take too long to actually finish it up. Uh, but a couple of things that you see here, you have a log, a view log that you can, you can go through. So this is also contained inside of the uh, Explorer. And then it takes kind of an upgrade report and it shows, hey, you know, you know we've got some errors. That they may or may not be something that you need to address right away. And then finally, the button to open the output. So I'm going to select open the output and I'm just going to take a, uh, I'm just going to copy this URL, I'm sorry, this uh, directory path and I'm going to close out of this window. All right, from here, I'm going to go and open this project up and you know it converted, obviously, whenever you see the extension at the end of UWP. And there you can see it. Okay. So I'm going to open the UWP project. And before where I called out that it was uh, Windows Phone 8.0, now we can see that it's actually uh, universal Windows. So what do we do as developers? The very first thing we do whenever we convert a project is we try to run it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch this over because I'm going to deploy this on my local machine and I'm going to run the application. And once I run it, I'm going to give it just a moment here. You will see that there is errors. And so the first error that it shows is that, hey, there's no overload for method show. This takes four arguments. So if I click on this, I can come into this and I can see, oh, okay, this actually looks like some of my coding for fun. Remember the about? Uh, dialog that was presented. So in the, uh, the about dialog, it showed, you know, there's four different pieces here uh, that it was actually expecting to come in. But from when after the conversion process, again, this isn't in the references any, any longer. It's now included inside of, um, pieces of it is included inside of the, this helpers uh, uh, folder that it created. I could actually just come back and I'm going to grab a snippet that I had and I'm going to drop this in this same spot. Um, and from here we can see that this is just creating new Windows Phone UWP, upgrade helpers, and then now it's just expecting you to define each one of those and I have defined each one of those. And then there's an about prompt dot show. Again, I would probably take this same application and I would try to run it again. So if I select local machine, I'll see now that there's still another error. And this time it's actually, uh, it's actually happening, happening inside of the main page.xaml. So it's not able to uh, complete, re completely render this screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this, this is actually a part of the Coding for Fun toolkit that would show some help for some memory diagnostics. So I'm going to remove that. Now we can see we're starting to get an application here. Um, and, but then I'm going to go back up to the top. And let me just expand this again. And there's still going to be a reference that's in here to the Coding for Fun toolkit. And again, we can see that was coming from this XML namespace with controls.coding for fun. So in this sample, 
I've really only made three changes. I know this is a, a, an app that really isn't that large. It was a sample app that was already existing on, on our site, but I think it's a good kind of test for you know, how things are kind of moving, moving along. So if I run the application again, this time again, it's actually going to, it's now a UWP. It's going to deploy it to my local machine, which isn't a phone. But once this first launches, you may remember this splash screen. This is a splash screen from the Windows Phone days. It's still not 100% there, but as we can see with just really three changes, uh, one in the C Sharp and two in the XAML, I now actually have a, a weather forecast that still works. Again, this is pulling you know, from you know, the internet here. So I'm going to you know, select another one. And you know, this data is pulling in just like we would expect. The other thing to note is that the back button that was on the Windows Phone has also been handled for you as well. Because uh, now you can just simply hit the back button at the top, and you're back to the beginning of the weather forecast sample. And the About button that we uh, looked at before, we still have the description. And so we can select About. And again, I've just changed the text uh, a tiny bit, but now we have uh, now we have the about dialog box. So that is just a very quick sample of using the mobilizes.net Windows Phone Silverlight Bridge. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is something that you may have heard of before. It was commonly referred to as Project Centennial, and now it's an integral part of the Windows 10 and the Universal Windows platform. So this is for your existing applications that you've made uh, using .NET. So I've talked to many people as I've been outside and working in the UWP booth, People that have been using WinForms, they already have a WinForms application. They currently uh, maybe already have a WPF application. They're looking about how do I bring this over to UWP. Um, the desktop app converter, it takes your application, and as you can see in this example, it's showing an MSI installer file, and then it's creating a Windows file package, and then it's, again, available for the store. Um, some of the reasons that people have been looking into this was obviously for an easier distribution and migration uh, process. And then also, you can start to begin to access the UWP APIs uh, within your application as you decide to start bringing in more and more functionality. You get to choose the path uh, that makes the most sense for your application. Um, so you can enhance your application. Uh, you can go ahead. You can add a process to it. You can add different types of services. And let's take a look at a couple of those. So at the bare minimum, you kind of start with converting the application. So you have a desktop application. You create this universal Windows package. And now the installation process, even if your application has registry entries and so forth, that's captured and also file system access, that's captured as well uh, through the convert process. So it's converted the application. Um, the next step is that you can start uh, enhancing and extending the application and start lighting up Windows 10 features. So where you may have a WinForms application that will, you know, has, a, has some functionality, that's already built in that you're used to, you may want to start you know, maybe integrating speech. Um, that's one of the common paths that I see. And then, and then especially with line of business apps, you may start wanting to think about inking and so forth. And you can migrate these over time. So you still have your application that you're currently using. You can start integrating more and more pieces of the Windows 10 APIs as you start working through the process. And then finally, uh, you can expand this to all devices once you've finally gotten your application to a point that you would like to start, uh, you would start to like broad, uh, start 
expanding your app to all of the devices that we currently have. Okay, again, another time for a demo. So this demo, I'm actually going to uh, talk a little bit more about the app packaging process. So there's been obviously a lot of questions uh, centered around, you know, manually packaging applications. And I don't know if you've watched some of the earlier, uh, earlier presentations, um, but there was an earlier presentation that talked about, hey, you know, here's an application um, that's using the desktop bridge. And um, they, were able, they were able to package that application. And there's another session that's later on that they're going to be using an installer. And then this one, I'm actually going to be, uh, I'm going to show you inside of Visual Studio the application. And then we'll take a look at what it takes to actually sign and create the app. So again, I'm going to go ahead and bring up that pack, that solution. Okay, so this is um, um, a pretty typical application that you're probably working with today. It's a very large uh, WPF application. And again, it's trying to load at the moment. But this application, you know, it's currently following the uh, MVVM pattern here. And there's a couple of different pieces to it. There's shared code. And there's also a couple of other uh, references to uh, anybody that was trying to uh, reach other types of devices. That's where you just saw Xamarin just uh, open up. And then there is an, also a part of this that worked with wearables. But we're really only concerned with this part, which is the desktop application. So that application has already been set to our startup project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the application. And again, it's going to crash. Because what it's going to do is as it examines this project, it's going to find out, hey, actually you're trying to do something that you cannot do in, in this typical application. And so it's crashing on a UWP API that it really doesn't know what exactly uh, it should do there. So again, um, we have an error. And so I'm going to stop the application. Because again, it, ha it doesn't know what we're trying to do. And I'm going to go to the desktop, and then I'm going to open the folder in my file explorer. And then there's this bin folder that contains all of the different, um, all of the different resources, like our localization, to our DLLs, to our executables, and so forth, that that application actually uses. So I'm going to bring that over and I've already copied that inside of my bin debug folder. Now, one of the things that I've went ahead and I've done since I've copied that over is that I have went in and I have added a couple of assets. So these are the assets that a Windows, a universal Windows platform application would need. So I've added the icons here just to kind of make the app a pretty. Uh, the other thing that I did was I went ahead and I created an AppX manifest. So an AppX manifest is required for a universal Windows platform app. Uh, you don't have to create these manually. There's actually quite a bit of documentation that's already existing on the web on how you would want to, uh, on how you would actually put that together. So I'm going to open that up just so you can actually see what that, that is like. Uh, so here you can see that there's, there's an identity name. Uh, if you scroll down through this, this was Windows uh, Desktop. This, uh, there's a min version and a max version. So these are the versions of Windows that it's using. This is both using this 14.393, is using the anniversary edition, the capabilities of the application. Also, the uh, executable file name would need to be contained in this. And finally, you can see that at the bottom, I've added a couple of logos. And those are right here and right here. OK, so there's two pieces that we've already, that we've already have put together. If I go back to the Win32 app, 
The other thing that I have uh, went ahead and done here is I've went ahead and I've copied over my, the proper certs. So I've created the certs beforehand and I've moved those over to this folder. And then the last thing is that there has to be this mapping file. Now this mapping file is just something that can be created simply out of like a notepad or whatever. But it just maps all of the different files that you have to what they, uh, to just the, basically the file name. And again, um, this was created mainly by hand, but you can, there's a couple of ways you could do that. So I have that, and then this is actually the package file. So I can remove that because I won't need that any longer. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up the Visual Studio uh, command prompt. I'm running the command prompt and I'm running it in administrator mode. And I'm going to begin with just using this package called, um, I'm sorry, this command called make apex and then pack, and then I'm going to specify the mapping file that I just showed you just a second ago. And then finally, I'm going to provide the output for the file name. And I'm just going to give this the name of myapp.appx. So at this point, we can see that the package creation has been successful. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to paste in the cert. Again, we'll take a quick look at the cert configuration. So I'm using certutil.addStore and then root and then the location of the certificate file. Once I do that, I'm going to hit OK. It's going to check the serial numbers and so forth, and it's going to say, okay, we've went ahead and we've applied a cert. So you may be thinking, you know, with this application, this application was named myhealth.client.desktop, may be able to go in here and do, actually, I may be able to come back over here and do this, but you're going to find that this is still not going to work. There's one last step that we need to do. So we hit OK or install, that's typically our developer workflow at times, and we say, hey, you know, ask the app developer for a new one. This one isn't signed. So the last step that we need to complete is actually signing it. So here I'm going to use our sign tool, sign tool.exe, sign, and then the cert, and then we give it the, uh, there's a couple of extra options here, and, uh, and then with verbose, and then finally we go ahead and give it the actual package. I'm going to hit OK here, and now it says, OK, done. OK, successfully sign this application. So we have the My App. So we're going to try running this one more time. So we try running it, and now we hit the Install button. And finally, it says, OK, healthclinic.biz is ready. And again, we could launch the application if we would like to. And we can see that now that UWP application that was crashing before because there were some notifications and there was some other stuff happening in the background, now that application is a UWP application. And we could find that application by just typing in healthclinic.biz, and we can see that, that is a Windows app. Okay, great. So, just to recap here, we just took a look at a existing WPF application, and Again, this was one that we were wanting to look at just manually installing because a lot, like I said, I believe a lot of the times that you may already have like some files that's possibly on a USB drive and you know, you may, this may be your whole application. Maybe it's just a console app or something like that and you may, you know, just hand that off, you know, to somebody else and uh, they install it there. And maybe you don't want to go through the store at least for your initial rounds of testing and so forth. This is one of the ways that you can manually package an application 
and we have documentation that's currently available um, on the web that kind of walks you through that process and, uh, and helps you uh, be successful with that. Okay, so we've talked it two ways uh, so far. We've talked to it looking, using the mobilize.net Silverlight Bridge and then the desktop app converter. And now we're gonna talk uh, just um, for a few minutes about some of the web platforms. So we already know that you've made plenty of investments that's on the web, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, we also know that you maybe have been using stuff like Cordova or PhoneGap. And a lot of these websites, you know, they already offer, you know, a great, you know, adaptive experience. Um, and maybe with that application, you may be interested in adding some additional platform capabilities. So one of the uh, common ones that I've been seeing is obviously people using Visual Studio tools for Apache Cordova. Uh, it has a couple of great things uh, out of the box in Visual Studio. Uh, it allows you to use, um, it allows you to create that application. Again, this is just a single install. Uh, all of the code is in Visual Studio. You can preview and test on all of these devices. Uh, debugging support as well. You can start accessing some of the native capabilities by pulling in different types of plugins uh, from the marketplace. And you have an application that runs across um, iOS, Android, as well as Windows 10 UWP. And then there is uh, just hosted web apps. So this is for the investments that you have currently already made um, on different types of websites. So we have like a browser that you've already built. We're going to package that up into a UWP application. And then finally, we're going to put that into the store. So with hosted web apps, obviously there's uh, support for all of the websites that's already currently hosted on a web server. Uh, the packaging goes ahead and adds an app manifest because you're able to do this completely through Visual Studio. And one of the nice things about hosted web apps is that it uses Microsoft Edge uh, for the web view. So while you're inside of the hosted web app that is running uh, as the debugging experience, you're gonna be able to use the uh, F12 key and start accessing and you can start manipulating some of the website in real time. Also, there is easier uh, monetization and engagement um, you have an app, uh, you have a website that's currently on this, that's currently, you know, on the web and somebody has to, you know, manually type that in. If it was already installed on Windows, when they, once they started typing that in, uh, they could obviously go to your UWP application uh, first. So this helps with discover other users discovering your site. And also, um, anytime there's any sort of update that you make and you decide to make that's uh, on your website, when they open up the hosted web app, it'll pull that in. Obviously, there's different types of offline uh, scenarios um, that is also baked in that you can uh, add if you would like, but um, that's, part of, that's part of the uh, helping you get this application started. And in the store quicker. Again, you can start monetizing um, by using uh, ads and in-out purchases and even trials if you would like to. And finally, once that application is on the machine, uh, people could then start using you know, things like Cortana to maybe launch your application, go to a specific page, or go ahead and enter maybe some details, some things, that, uh, things that's most interesting to you, especially for your application. Okay. Um, let's take a look now at a hosted web app. Okay, I am going to, again, we're going to just create a new project with this one. And I'm going to just go file new project. And here I have been in the, my visual C sharp and windows. Now I'm just going to navigate down and I'm going to go into JavaScript windows and then universal. 
and you can see I have the option here for a hosted web app. So hosted web app, and we'll just leave the default name. Um, what I'm going to do here is it obviously whenever you're creating a new Universal Windows Platform project, you can select the minimum version and the target version. I'm just going to leave these at the, as the default for now, and I'm going to select OK. While that's spinning up, I'm going to grab one of the URLs that I'm planning on using. Okay, so we have a hosted web app. Uh, we've given it a very creative name, and underneath the references, there isn't anything here. One of the things you'll notice that in, is that underneath the images, it ha we have went ahead and placed in a couple of default images for you. So I usually take those images and then I go ahead and I try to match those up with maybe if I've created whatever I've created, like my fave icon from or something like that. And um, then I'll have all of the images that's needed. It's created a temporary key here for us, and then there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of pages that it created just for some uh, error. And then there's finally the pa package.apex manifest, which is where we're going to be spending most of our time today. So we have the display name, and then we have our start page. So on our start page, I have simply just uh, copied and pasted. I've simply copied and pasted a start page that goes to this Contoso Travel. And we're going to leave the default English, and we're really going to leave pretty much everything um, alone in this application. One of the things that I'm going to uh, do, though, is I'm going to move over to the content URIs, and I am going to change this first rule. It says URI, and it has example. And I'm going to just paste in that same example. Uh, the rule here is to include, and when RT access, you can change these. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set it to give it all permissions, where it can do um, pretty much everything. Um, and then I'm going to run the application to see how this website, which you know it was absolutely working fine over you know here. If I run this inside of a browser. Um, you could see kind of how the application works. Again, this is all standard. Uh, this is all standard HTML until you get to this point. And at this point, there's nothing that's actually happening, and that's because again, this isn't tying into any of the uh, native UWP APIs. So this would normally pull up something from your uh, people, and you could select their name, and then finally you could add it to like a calendar, for example. Then finally, you would see your trip, and you could use a toast notification. So uh, again, that's kind of the workflow of this app. Let's go ahead and deploy this to our local machine again. So I'm dropping this on my local machine. And it's going to say, where do you want to go? So this time, again, this is if I'm using F12. We can see this is the actual F12 debugger tools. And if we wanted to, this is in the DOM Explorer. You know, where do you want to go? And we could change this. I'll just change this to just where, just to show you an example of changing the code um, live if you wanted to start making adjustments and so forth. So where uh, we're going to select New York, we're going to pick a date of the 27th, and let's just say we're coming back on the 28th. We'll select confirm. Now, whenever we select this button to choose a friend, you'll notice that this once was just a hosted web app, is now it's actually pulling in our different types of contacts. And again, if you're wondering where that's actually coming from, you can go to you know people, and you can see inside of the contacts, I have three contacts located here, and that's where it's pulling those from. So I'm just going to, uh, oh, I think I closed it. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to select somebody, and then I'm going to select confirm. 
And now it's going to ask, you know, add to system calendar. So if we go to, again, the calendar, and I'm on Tuesday, the 27th. This is, again, just using my Microsoft calendar. I could come back and I could add this, and I could select Accept. I'll come back to the application, and now at 12, uh, as I said, for 12 a.m., uh, the trip to New York is located there. And then finally, since this is, again, a hosted web app, I can still keep interacting with Windows 10 by pulling up different types of Toast notifications. And here it's obviously it gave the ding, and it said, you know, pack your bags for New York. You know, you're leaving uh, basically today. Um, so that is, uh, that is at least a quick sample of a hosted web app. Uh, you can do other things with this. Uh, you can obviously, if you would like to just, you know, play with an application. Sometimes I open up something like CodePen.o, uh, and I have like my HTML on one side, and then I have JavaScript on the other side. And you can manipulate JavaScript real time, and you can start adding JavaScript and start calling different APIs inside of your hosted web app as it's actually running, if you just want to start experimenting and kind of learning the technology from, from there. And one other thing before I leave this area is that if you go ahead and you tie in, you know, for example, the camera or something of that nature, you can, you still need to come in and actually turn on the different capabilities. So the only capability that's on by default is just internet and client, and that obviously is something that is going to be required for something that's going to be calling out to the web. But if you were to, you know, maybe save a picture from the camera, uh, you may want to go ahead and just add the check mark here to, you know, the pictures library, and then make sure uh, that your uh, URL that you paste in here has access to the WinRT libraries. Okay, that was just a, uh, that was another just kind of a quick kind of overview of hosted web apps. <coughs> Finally, let's stop for a second and let's talk about some of the other mobile platforms uh, that you already have and that you may have already been using and working with. So for Android and for iOS apps, uh, we've currently been working on and recently published a porting guidance. So there is, you know, a, approximately in, in this sample, there is, you know, data, there's a general concept of what data is and what it's doing, and then the equivalence of Android, iOS, and then finally the Windows 10 UWP. There's additional information on Windows 10 UWP uh, where you can actually click on these hyperlinks, but this, uh, this document's broken out into 15 sections and that you can actually scroll through this you know, fairly quickly and find the different things that, that matters to you, like monetization to notifications and sensors and so forth. If you would take, like to take a look at this document, it's located at aka.ms uh, forward slash UWP porting map. And then from there, I also have a couple of other links that I wanted to include if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to take a deeper dive on just the uh, our mobile guidance. And these, this presentation, the slides will be available after uh, the talk. But then I wanted to take some time to take a look at iOS applications. And for many people that already has an iOS app, whether it's running on iPad or whether it's running on iPhone, and you're looking at ways that you can take that uh, application and you can bring that over to the Windows Universal Platform. So anybody that's using uh, or has built an application using Objective-C uh, knows how painful it has been at times. Um, so if you've already built and you already know, you know Objective-C and you have the application, uh, now you can start taking you know, the header file, the implementation files, and the C++ CPP files, and you can create those into a uh, Windows package, Windows Store, uh, Universal Windows app package, and then you can push that over to the store. 
Uh, one of the things about this is that uh, this is all about code sharing and reuse. Um, strictly, this is not, you know, a not right once run everywhere type of promise that, you know, we, you know, hear a lot. Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, Objective-C is Windows native, so your iOS app is a completely native UWP application. You can uh, obviously reach all of the Windows 10 de device families. I've seen people that have built Objective-C apps that, that was strictly for the iPad at the beginning, and now it's working just absolutely you know, great on their service device. And also keyboard and mouse support. And again, you can mix and match code in uh, UI and add different capabilities like you have been seeing kind of all throughout kind of as you go, because I know it's hard to think of, okay, let's just you know, completely convert the app and then you know, uh, publish it and so forth. You can start adding those features. So the process works very similar to this. You have a Xcode project that you will copy. Uh, you run this VS importer from the command prompt. After that, you open the project in Visual Studio and you can make changes uh, using Objective-C. And yes, Objective-C is a language that is supported in Visual Studio. Uh, there's even syntax highlighting uh, if you decide to go ahead and install uh, um, one, of our, one of our VSX installers. And then finally, you can deploy to Windows. So what I'm going to do in this next demo is I'm going to take an existing iOS application that uh, that we've used internally, and I'm going to convert that to the universal Windows platform. So let me just switch one more time. Okay. Okay, there is uh, the one requirement is that you're going to need to download the Win OBJC um, runtime and the files. I've went ahead and downloaded this, and you can actually just get this off of GitHub. So if you go to GitHub, you can um, you can do a search for Win OBJC. Here we have a calculator application. And one of the things that you'll notice inside of this application is that this is the Xcode proj file. And inside of this, there is some Windows 10 that I've went ahead and I've put in, but I don't necessarily need those uh, at the moment because I've went ahead and converted this application. But this is going to be some of the output. Let's take a look at what it actually takes to start converting this application over. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab a command here. Okay, so I've went ahead and I've switched to the directory, and I'm just doing a listing here, uh, and just to see what we already have. Again, we just took a quick look at some of the files that were in this folder. And then I'm going to point this to the, I'm going to point this to the winobjc bin slash vsimporter.exe, and then I'm going to press return. So I did that and very quickly what just happened was it created a couple of different items. It started with the importer command and then it created the VSX items, the VSX proj, and then finally you'll see that it actually created the calculator-winstore10.solution file. So this is actually my starting point if I wanted to start taking a look at this, this application. So in Visual Studio. So I'm going to go back to Calculator, 
Again, you can see this is everything still kind of remains intact. It hasn't made any changes to that existing application. And I'm going to grab the file location for the solution. And we're going to open this inside of Visual Studio. So I'm opening the project now. So now it's starting to, uh, it's starting to take some time. But once it finishes, uh, we'll see that it's went ahead and it's created uh, this calculator that's universal windows. Inside of this, it has uh, all of the different types of references that it's found that it may need uh, for this application, external dependencies. And then the calculator, you'll notice that this, again, is the app delegate, the same exact app delegate in using uh, Objective-C as well. And if we close out of that, we can see that there's common, and then there's the Xcode variable files. But now we're starting to drill down into some of the stuff that we may be you know, slightly familiar with. So we have the app.xaml file, and the rest of this is a lot of the packaging stuff. And then the headers have already been included uh, for this application. So let's take this application and let's run this. So every time uh, with this file, with this, uh, when an app's converted, it's going to have to recompile the application and starts the build process. And then finally, the application will finally deploy to the local machine. So this calculator application um, was working uh, in on iOS, on iPad, and on iPhone. And now that same application is working over on Windows uh, 10. So I'm going to close that application. And let's go ahead and switch back over one more time to the slides. So one of the things that I wanted to say about the Win OBJC um, runtime after you download it and you start using the Windows Bridge for iOS is that keep in mind that this was uh, you know, it's a fairly simple demo. This is not a turnkey solution. So there is obviously things that you're going to need to do in order to get the application to work. Um, I just wanted to let you know that that's one of the things that we're currently working on and we're investing on. Um, and you can download this at github.com uh, forward slash Microsoft forward slash win OBJC. Okay, I have a couple more things that I wanted to look at here. Uh, just as a quick recap uh, of the session today, we're constantly, you know, working with our middleware partnerships, you know, you know to ensure that you can continue to use your current uh, ecosystem of tools. We've also been a working to expand your investments that are currently on the web, um, whether that be, you know, Apache Cordova, PhoneGap, and even um, your existing websites. And then finally, we've been working with various types of different bridges for Windows, as well as other mobile platforms, as you saw today with the desktop app converter moving over from uh, WPF, WinForm application, to something that now runs on UWP. And then finally, we have porting guidance for Android and iOS as well as we have another bridge for people that have already built and developed with uh, iOS. There is a couple of other sessions. So you've seen kind of, you know, a very high overview of what we were, what we're talking about. There is a couple of deeper dive sessions that I would like for you to at least take a look at and see. Um, so there was one yesterday that's currently available online uh, by Andy Wigley. There is another one that's coming up uh, later on today at 12.30. And this one is all about bringing existing desktop apps to the universal Windows platform. Again, Project Centennial. It's going to be at 12.30. Um, that's, again, these are 75-minute breakout sessions where you kind of just saw the overview. Now you can go way deeper into the technology. Another one that I would like to call out, at least on this slide, is the last one. And that is the bringing, bring existing web apps to Windows 10 with hosted web apps. Again, a nice breakout session on that. Then throughout the week, uh, we have a couple of other sessions. Uh, again, you may want to take a look at designing a great user experience for universal Windows platform apps. And then finally, um, 
Thursday, there's several, uh, there's several apps here. Again, architecting your Windows app to work together, moving away from these monolithic apps. And then finally, uh, using Windows Pen and Ink to build more engaging enterprise applications. Um, that has a lot of really cool stuff in it. And even when I've been experiencing, uh, playing and experiencing with some of this, uh, just think, for example, you know, your customer could use a pen and they could, if they were inside of you know, your LOB app or whatever, they could draw a circle and it would switch over to, say for example, a pie chart, or they could draw some lines and it would switch to a line chart. So there's a couple of different ways that you could possibly engage with um, pen and ink. And then there is a lot of different theater sessions. So the last thing that I talked about was the uh, bring your iOS apps over. Um, there's a session, a theater session that's on that, that's on uh, the Thursday. No, I'm sorry, that's on 927 and it's at uh, 210. And then also I'll be also uh, delivering some sessions as well uh, on building great app experiences uh, for the Universal Windows platform. I would love to actually chat with you a lot more. Uh, yesterday I had a lot of great conversations. Uh, we are actually the team that's, that has been working a lot on this has, is in the Microsoft Showcase area. I'm going to actually go there after the session. I'm obviously will be here to chat with you, but uh, I would love for you to also you know go ahead and continue the conversation. So you can do that by aka.ms and then forward slash windev at msignite. And if you're wondering where exactly we're at. Uh, all you have to do is look for the developer section. So um, you'll see the Microsoft MVP group. Um, that If you see that, you know you're in the right area. We're just right in between that and the security. Uh, another thing is, is that please uh, make sure to evaluate uh, this session and all the sessions here. Um, sometimes people use the QR codes. If not, you can obviously just go and you can just start searching for it. And then finally, a couple of additional resources. Uh, you can go to developer.microsoft.com forward slash windows, and you can start seeing some of the things that we have to offer. If you're very interested in, if you're particularly interested in the bridges, you can go developer.microsoft.com forward slash windows forward slash bridges. The other thing is that I would like for you to at least jot down my email. And then if you have any questions after this, I mean, you know, you're on a plane or on you know, thinking on the way home, um, you will have my email address and you can contact and reach out to me you know, individually. I love keeping up with people outside of, you know, outside of the conference and as well as in the conference. And if you use social media, I'm on there as well, just at MB Crump. But that is pretty much it. I am uh, right on time with like a minute and a half to spare to give you at least some time for Q&A. &A. Um, so that is it. So, Thank you, I hope you were able to at least uh, kind of get a grasp on some of the different technologies and some of the things that we're trying to do to uh, bring your existing code over to our Windows 10 platform. Thanks.